Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. We are very privileged to have Mr. William Allman with us. How are you today, sir? Uh, good to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me. And uh, call me Billy. Okay. So um, you're an author of a humorous book about uh, life in the military, and you were a trainer as well, right? That's correct. Yeah, I'm an author of a, a funny book about U.S. Navy SEALs and their unabashed uh, humor. And uh, I did 23 years in the SEAL teams. I was in SEAL Team 1, SEAL Team 4, SEAL Team 8, Red Cell, and uh, U.S. Naval Special Warfare Group 2. And uh, yeah, so I did a lot of training of guys that are in the SEAL teams as well. So yeah, I was reading uh, in, on LinkedIn all the things that you you did as far as training goes can you talk a little bit about that yeah sure um training uh it, it's never ending actually uh when you're a seal on active duty you're you're constantly training uh you 28 weeks of training to get through uh buds which is basic underwater demolition seal training and then you go on to uh go into the teams and then in the teams, you'll be there for probably another eight months to a year going through all kinds of courses that you're going to specialize in as a SEAL. And uh, so you're looking at a good year and a half, two years of training before you're put into a platoon and then sent off to do uh, missions around the world. Uh, they can vary uh, because it depends on uh, where you're going to be assigned or what team. Each team has an area of uh, responsibility in the world, and uh, that's why there's so many of them. But uh, so each each team has their own little uh, area of responsibility and where, the, where they're going to go and what they do and what they train for. So um, is, is it anything like you see in the movies? <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask. I had to ask. Those seals make crappy actors, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, there's some uh, there's some there's some truth to some things, um, like uh, GI Jane when they uh, start kicking your food off the table and uh, you see people shoving food in their pockets that they can eat later. Yeah, that that's kind of on the true side. And um, being uh, dumped on all the time, uh, like uh, Hell Week is where in training, when you're going through BUDS training, and um, it's five days without sleep. And you start to hallucinate around your third day. And uh, we were out in the, in the little rubber boats that you see us paddling in some of the movies, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, seven man boat and uh we're out in the pacific ocean paddling away because you go like down about a mile or two miles paddling to come in on some rocks and stuff like that so one of the anyway during our paddle down in the ocean one of the guys yelled out train and uh, we all jumped out of the boat into the water because we did not believe him you know he saw a train he's just hallucinating wow. but uh it's just you know so it's 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 funny and it's stupid, but you know, yeah, it's like train, okay, <laughs> All right? I'm freaking million. So a lot of that stuff is funny, but uh, it's just uh, a way of weeding you out. Hell Week is the worst part of it all because a lot of guys can't deal with the cold, uh, the wetness, and uh, lack of sleep. So the sleep deprivation part is a good way of weeding out guys that aren't. Uh, don't have their mind set on actually going to to become, you know, a Navy SEAL. Yeah, well, it takes a special kind of person for that kind of thing. So, I mean, that's like they just break you down psychologically, right? Yes, they do. Yeah, they do. So, and they tell you, any, you can quit anytime you want. You know, SEAL is a volunteer unit. You don't have to stay there. So, you, you know, you can quit anytime. You know, just ring that bell and you'll be warm. You know, give you a hot cup of coffee, whatever you want, hot meal. You can go to sleep. You know, you don't have to take this stuff. Just go ring that bell and quit. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to, you're running, you're tired, you're freezing, you know, you're soaking wet, you're full of sand. 
you know, they take sand, and they dump it down inside your pants, you know, and everything, you know, so you, there's no place you're not sandy. And they said, just go ring the bell. You don't have to subject yourself to this. You can quit, you know, so they're always on you to quit, quit, quit. And they want the guy that doesn't want to quit. That's all. Oh, of course. So, yeah, you've, you've taken the, the dark side of your experience and, and you've changed it to humor. Yeah. So I've got to hear more about the book. Well, the book is, uh, yeah, it's all true stories, by the way. The names were changed to protect the innocent, except for mine. And uh, <laughs> I wrote it. <clears throat> I had some guys in the seal saying, hey, leave my name in there. I go, no, no, we're not going to lose payback stuff through the years. You know, it's, it's so I altered a few of the locations because some, some of that information had to be protected. And I didn't want to write about tactics and things like that that we use because I don't want to help the enemy out. Right, so if, if you want to know what kind of idiots we can be, read my book. Uh, the, the, there's a part in the book where there's a jealousy between the two coasts, the East Coast and the West Coast. West Coast is Hollywood frogmen. East Coast are the deployed devil dogs of their earth. You know, just, so anyway, West Coast, you're a puke. East Coast, you're an operator. There's no difference between the SEALs. There really isn't. The training's all the same. It's, it's just rivalry between the two coasts is all it is. So. I decided one day I was going to learn Spanish because I was at SEAL Team 1, Mexico's right there. So I figured, what the heck, you know? This is long before they had any other teams. The only teams that existed at that time were SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2. And then they had UDT units, Underwater Demolition Team units. But uh, so I decided, heck, I'll go to a Defense Language Institute up in Monterey and learn how to speak Spanish. So that was logical to me. So I went away to the school and lo and behold, they transferred me to the East Coast. Go figure. Well, that, at that time, they were forming up. They were taking all the UDT teams and making SEAL teams out of them. Because they didn't really need the underwater demolition side. Although you're trained in that as a SEAL. So why not just make everybody SEAL? So that's what they did. And one day, boom, boom, everybody's a SEAL. So at that time... It was uh, early 80s and El Salvador was going on. So I was sent down to El Salvador and uh, for the war because I spoke Spanish. <clears throat> and uh, I'm getting to the humor side. So while we're down there, the media was blocked from going to certain parts of the country. You couldn't go there if you're a part of the media. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you got your daily briefings from the U.S. Embassy, which was in the capital, San Salvador. I was all the way in the south in La Union and uh, near the, the border where uh, Nicaragua was and uh, where Honduras was. And uh, one day I'm coming back from a training exercise with uh, the commandos that I was training, El Salvadorian commandos, and I see this truck pickup truck with it had tv taped on it and here comes a cameraman and um, a reporter and she stuck a microphone in my face and said here we have a proof positive that americans are involved in combat operations in el salvador and i knew she had no right to be there the embassy would tell me if somebody was coming down any anybody was coming down mm -hmm. so i knew she had no right to be there she goes, what do you have to say for yourself? And it was Leslie Stahl. I don't know if you remember Leslie Stahl. That name sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah she, was, she was the one that was on the microphone. So <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a full personal interview if you just shut that camera off right now, shut your tape recorder off. And I just want to talk to my guys and I'm going to sit right here and I'll give you a full interview. And she said, okay. So I see the light go off on the camera. She shuts her recorder off. And I turned to my guys and in Spanish told them, arrest them. So they arrested them, took all their stuff, and I smashed all their video stuff. Oh, just wow. destroyed it all to hell. And I locked, I locked them up where we hold uh, prisoners of war. Mm. And uh, so she's screaming and she goes, you're going to be in so much trouble. You can't arrest an American citizen. And I go, down here, you're not a citizen. You're subject to the rules of war and the articles of war. 
that are right. going on in this country. You have no idea how serious the problem is that you're, you know, the depth of the trouble that you're in. <clears throat> I called the U.S. Embassy and I said, I've got two reporters down here, cameraman and Leslie Stahl. And they said, they're not authorized to be there. And I says, oh, I took care of the problem. I got them locked up. Can you send a helicopter down to pick them up and bring them back to the Capitol? They're going to do that. And they tell them they're going to send them out of the country. They're, you know, they're going to be gone. So I said, well, how long can I expect? How long do I have to wait before I can expect the helicopter? And they said, well, it'll be there in about an hour at the most. And I said, okay. So I went to uh, my Intel guy who was uh, El Salvadorian. And I told him, this is what I want you to do. I want you to scare the living hell out of them. And so they, they said, okay, good. So they went to him and thank God he could speak English. And he's tell, he looks at him and he tells him, you're going to be shocked <laughs> for treason against my government. You're spying. You are international spies. No, we're not. We're Americans. <laughs> no, you're spying, you know, for the, for the, uh, for the enemy forces. You're providing them information. He goes, I have intelligence that says this. You went down through all these roads here. And he did get that information where the roads where they came. And uh, he goes, you're going to be shot. And I says, don't shoot him. Don't shoot him. He goes, okay, okay. We'll throw them from the helicopter. <laughs> okay, that sounds all right. And she's, Leslie Stahl's going, you're okay with us? I says, it's his country. I'm just an advisor here, okay? I have no authority other than to train his troops. That's all I'm here to do is to train their troops. I am not authorized to go on combat missions, nothing. I'm just here to train their troops. And so the cameraman the guy, he, he's crying. He goes, I've got a, I've got a daughter, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. And I says, well, I'm glad you're sorry, but you know, it, it is what it is. And uh, so the other, Leslie so I was going, you can't do this. You can't do this. And I says, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing anything. He's going to do it. So at this time, you know, you can hear the helicopters coming in, you know. And I says, is there anything that you want me to say or pass on, you know, to the U.S. Embassy or anything like that before you guys go in the helicopter? And uh She's going, you're, you're not serious. You're not serious. I know you're not serious. I go, okay. Like I said, it's not me, it's him. So we had him handcuffed, put him in the back of the Jeep, and we're driving out to a Stata Mayor with the, uh, the major <laughs> where they land and uh, take over, or, you know, the helicopters land and they take over all the other people. And uh, so they're waiting there. And here comes the helicopter and then it's starting to sing in, sink into her. And she goes, I've made a big mistake. And I go, yeah, you have. She goes, is there anything you can do? Is there anything you can say to him to help us? Please, we're Americans. As one American to another, please help us. And I said, I can't, I'm sorry. And uh, so helicopters landing. The other guy's crying hysterically, you know, so I unhandcuffed him, you know, and turned him over to the guys, you know, the El Salvadorian helicopter, but the pilots were American. So when they saw the pilots, Leslie turns around and starts doing this to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that probably is something they'll never forget. Well, they were out of the country that day, but it, it felt so good, man the news media yeah i got you <laughs> you know you i meet so many people that have been in the military and of course i have a lot of people in our family that was military um especially like my grandfather i'd love to sit and hear all the stories that he had to tell and i'd love oh, everybody's yeah. perspective and i think every one of you should write a book but what i mean what motivated you to actually start writing but yeah, if you, okay, to write a book, if you, if you love rejection, write a book, try to get it published. Mm. If you're into rejection, 
I cannot tell you, maybe 200 rejections of my book before uh, the lady from Pimpin' Press read it. And she goes, is this in any way the truth? I said, it's the whole truth. It really is. There's no lies in this book at all. Everything in there is the absolute truth. And uh, she goes, I'm going to publish that. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, but uh, it, what got me to do it, to answer your question was, you know, people sit down and uh, people in our line of work, police officers, you know, emergency room people, firefighters. I mean, firefighters are, are, are a strange breed because they run into burning buildings, you know, and they deal with the charred death of bodies, you know, women and children, men, uh, everything, animals. Uh, and I'm sure they don't go back home and then read a book on firefighting, you know, I mean, the, the challenges of a firefighter, you know, and stuff like that. I felt that people that see the horrors in life would much rather laugh, you know, find the humor in it and laugh. And so that's what I did. And I, I knew that we did a lot as SEALs as far as laughing at each other. I, I remember one time uh, during a firefight, I was arguing with my SEAL brother next to me. We were fighting back and forth, not verbally arguing, but we were trying to get covered behind a tree during this, the bullets are flying and everything. I'm pushing him out of the way. He's pushing me out of the way. And we're fighting for cover behind this tree. The tree was this big around. Oh, no. And no bullet would stop it. <laughs> or no no tree would stop that bullet. You know, and it was just a thin little tree, but it was your little home, you know. <laughs> and, and that alone is funny. And uh, one of the guys, you know, we jumped into a bomb crater during a firefight. And he goes, my foot's in the air. It's going to get shot. My foot's in the air. And, shit, I'm shot. I'm shot. I'm shot. I told you guys, you know, and we're laughing at him. You know, it was funny. And uh, I'll tell you a really good funny story is <laughs> we were we were on a patrol. And uh, one of the guys, nature calls. Okay, it's not just pee. Sometimes you got to take a dump. Right. So the guy says, I, I got to go to the bathroom. We're looking at him. We'll just, you know, lay down on the ground, and take a piss, you know, and so you don't make noise, you know. And uh, so he says, uh, no, I, I got to take a dump. So, oh, okay. Do your business. So we set up our security, you know, and he's digging a hole to bury it in. And then he's squatting over the hole. Well, he took a shot in the nuts. Oh no. And we all hit the ground and we're looking around where the next shot's coming from, you know, but it never came. Oh my gosh. And he's screaming in agony and we're looking for any bullets that are going to come and none of them ever came. And uh, so we got out of there with him and we started laughing our asses off because think about it. This enemy soldier took the time to aim at his nuts could have aimed at his head but he aimed at his nuts oh my god and shot him in <laughs> oh no no he lost one testicle so you know of course we nicknamed him one nut you know, <laughs> <laughs> so he had that name for the rest of his life whenever you see him david you say hey one nut now you doing man? hey doing good man <laughs> true story funny as hell but you know it's just there's humor in combat it really is. And so that's what I try to concentrate the book on is the humorous side of things, you know, so that you laugh about stuff that uh, w was crazy. Uh, another time was uh, in Vietnam and we had two VC coming down the river. They were going to, we had intel that they were going to be there at such and such time, you know, and uh, so we're waiting a long time in the water. You're up, you know, to your neck in water and you're just waiting. And of course, it's getting close to dawn now, and uh, we thought he's not going to come, but we got the intel he's going to come. So you sit there and wait, and sure as shit, you see him coming. So we opened up with machine guns on these two guys to kill him. And mm. uh, you got to stop. If you ever shot in water, you know how it splashes up and everything. And right. so imagine machine guns, all, all that water going up. You can't see anything, so you got to stop shooting. 
So we saw one guy, he's floating face down. We knew he was in with blood and stuff. So we knew he was uh, dead, but the other guy's swimming to the other side of the river. And so we start shooting at him again. Then you got to stop because you got to see where he's at. And he continues shooting and stop, shoot, stop, shoot. Finally, he makes it to the other side and he's waist deep in muck and mud, you know, he's trying, he's trying to move real slow and he can't really go that fast. So he realizes, you know, that we got him, you know, so he turns around, looks at us, he's yelling at us in Vietnamese, I'm in chest, and he sticks his hands out, you know, and instead of shooting him, we just... <laughs> <laughs> We didn't shoot him. You know, the officers said, hey, he made it all that way. You know, good on him. You know, what the heck? You know, it just wasn't his day to die. So we could have killed him, but we did. You know, it's, it's just sometimes you got to admire that, you know, the right. bravery of that guy to turn around. Don't know what he yelled, but pound in his chest, step his arms out, you know, like, go ahead, do it. You know, and just nah, that, that needed to be respected. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, with the, the seriousness of war, and you know the the negativity that goes on in this world i can appreciate the fact that you you look for the humor yeah to, to get your point across and i think that's one of the problems we have today is nobody wants to think positively it's just it's a it's i'm going to draw a line in the sand you're either on this side or you're on this side yeah we need something to bring us together and humor is i think one of those factors it really is and you know war to me is a re is the ultimate last resort you know when you're young and in a specialized unit for combat mm -hmm. you actually do want to go to war you want to see if this training that you've got really does work you know that that's your youth and your ignorance but after you've been in battles and you've engaged in the enemy and stuff like that been shot at been wounded whatever you realize that you know this this is serious stuff this is this is for keeps you're killing somebody's brother somebody's father somebody's mother sister cousin aunt uncle whatever you know they have a family like you and a wise officer once told me you know the enemy is fighting for everything that he believes is right and just so are you can you tell me who's wrong right like you know and it, and it was so profound, you know, and, and he's right. And he goes, that's why you never try to moralize war. Don't try to sterilize it, moralize it in any way. It's an ugly, ugly business, and it should be the absolute last result, you know, of anything. So, yeah, you understand that after a while. You grow up and you realize, you know, <clears throat> it is the last resort, and it should always be the last resort, and it should never be glamorized, and it should never, there's, there's no glory in war, there's nothing poetic about it, you know, it's just life and death, and it's ugly, and uh, if people would realize that, you know, they would r also realize that we need to really get along together, yeah. you know, let, let's, let's see what we can do to get along together, let's, let's make it work, you know, because in the end, it's going to be very ugly and we don't want it to be ugly. We want it to work. So yeah, you're right. We need to look for something that can help us get along and, and not be so hateful toward each other. And I can, I use hate as a word that I don't understand because the enemies that I've shot and killed, I didn't hate them. I didn't even know them, right. you know? So how can I hate somebody? I don't know. I know he's killed my brothers some of my sealed brothers, I know he's tried to kill me, but I'm trying to kill him too, you know? And so I might dislike you, you know, despise you, but I won't hate you. That to me, that's the ultimate word. And uh, you really have to have a justifiable reason for hating somebody so much. Because that to me is an ultimate word, but uh, you, we really need to do, figure out ways to get along and, and political differences to dislike someone because of that. Come on. Everybody's got an opinion, positive, negative, whatever. I'm glad you have an opinion. I'm glad you're passionate about your opinion, but don't dislike me because of my opinion. You know, exactly. I'm not wrong because I have an opinion it, and it differs from you. Don't, 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 don't attack me that way. You know, you, you can both have passionate sides of an argument and you can agree to disagree, but you know, in the end, let's just respect each other. Oh, for sure. 
Yeah. You know, that's just like marriage. You know, the world ought to think of, of you know <laughs> loving each other or liking each other. Yeah. Just like you do in marriage. You don't always like the same things. You don't always mm -hmm. agree on the same thing, but you find a compromise. Yeah, you do. Which is, you know, I, I, I feel, yeah, we need a Republican party and we need a Democratic party. You know, because there, you got to come up with something that's going to be viable for everyone. Unfortunately, it just seems like they try to divide us and I, I don't, I don't go for that. I can go outside and talk to my neighbor and he's not the same color as I am. Yeah. But we don't care. We don't point no. that fact out. We just, you know, have a barbecue together or, or hang out on the porch and, you know, drinking soda water or whatever and just mm -hmm. having a conversation. We need yeah. to get back to that. I mean, I've, I agree. I, I remember, maybe I'm just being ignorant or whatever, but as a child, I just don't remember it being that bad. I remember just everybody still went to the movies together, went to the ball games together and, you know, so what if you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, whatever. Exactly. Exactly. It shouldn't have anything. One thing should have nothing to do with the other, you know, and if it, if that's the way it's got to be, then you're a very shallow person. Exactly. You really are. Exactly. So I think I already know the answer to this question, but, um, and I, I don't mean to be personal, but do you ever, whenever you were serving and, and you said you were a police officer at one time, correct? Yes. Um, did you ever feel disrespected and, and unappreciated? No, no, no. Um, if I had to say unappreciated, yeah, sometimes, but it's more on a departmental thing, in the political aspect of the department mm -hmm. and their regulations and stuff like that on what they allow you to do or not do. Uh, every department is different. Uh, some of them <clears throat> leave, uh, leave the uh, decision to arrest or not arrest up to you or to write a ticket or not write a ticket up to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some uh, some departments are are mandatory. You've got to write so many tickets this month so that I know that you're actually out there doing your job. And with that, it's to me that's wrong. You know, you're you're forcing a negativity on a populace. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be in an area where there's actually good people. You don't need to hassle them. Leave them alone. Right. You know, and. Uh, so as an officer, you're always out there looking for suspicious activity. It's your nature to do that. It's your job to do that. And uh, so, you know, some elements are more suspicious than others, but uh, it's just in some age groups are more suspicious than others. And uh, how I reacted as a police officer depended on the person that I was dealing with. If they came off irate, crazy, uh, disrespectful, well, that heightened my awareness and my uh, response to him. And, uh, how I was going to treat him, how I was going to act. And, uh, you know, I mean, I cut a lot of people breaks, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can tell you I, what I did to one, uh, one gentleman, um, and I got in trouble for it. I, uh, he was... A drunk driver but he was stopped at a stoplight and uh i knocked on the window because the light turned green and he wasn't moving and uh he had his foot on the brake and uh he was passed out on the wheel oh, no. and uh his door wasn't locked so i opened it and i <laughs> put his car in park and uh i i woke him up and i says uh can your wife come here and get you because you're clearly inebriated you know can't be driving can you should come here and get you within the next 30 minutes and he said yeah sure i said the only stipulation is your car is going to be towed because you're not going to come back and get your car it's going to be towed and he said okay so but it was about 10 minutes his wife showed up and i turned him over to his wife and she was 
ever so grateful to me. Well, he wrote a letter to my chief of police thanking him for officers like me because I was clearly drunk. He could have arrested me, but he didn't. And my chief just ripped me a new ass. <laughs> I bet. <clears throat> he thought this, he was doing something good. <laughs> this is not the kind of letter I want to get from my officers. You know, just like, whoa. You know, and uh, I didn't know who the guy was. There's no reason why. He, it's just that he was very nice. He was very uh, respectful. You know, even though he was drunk, he's, he goes, you know, I, I'm really drunk. I'm wrong. And I, and I know I'm going to jail on him sorry you know and i looked up other offenses he's never had anything not even so much as a parking ticket you know so i didn't feel like uh destroying his life and his career because uh you know i just didn't want to do it so that was up to me well being a police officer it's kind of a catch-22 because you if you do something like apprehending somebody who's doing something wrong or before they do something wrong mm-hmm. you the, you're, you're either praised for it or you're your people are mad at you for doing it well so, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't for sure exactly. and uh they can bring race into it all they want to but uh i mean the gentleman that i did that for he was black mm-hmm. and uh but i didn't care i don't see that like I said, how I reacted as a police officer depended on the person I was dealing with. If you're respectful in every, all your demeanor, I'll be the same to you. I'll give you back that respect you're giving me. And I think that's what every police officer should do. And are there cops out there that have that badge that's bigger than their freaking head or makes their head bigger than their head? Yeah, there is. You know, you know there, there's assholes in every organization. It doesn't matter if they're police or not, but every organization has them. And uh, so, yeah, you take the good with the bad, but uh, sometimes, you know, the good takes a while to come along. Oh, yeah. Well, I worked for the city for 20 years, and I saw the politics and how if one mayor was in, you got treated a certain way, and then another Uh, mayor comes in, you're treated a different way. Um, You know, you're limited to what you can say to people and you know you'd get in trouble for some of the stupidest things they control the money exactly exactly i mean the benefits were great i i mean i i got to retire i mean i had to retire for medical reasons but you know i I retired early nice pension you know but i'm glad to be away from the city i i love the people that i worked with but the politics were awful yeah they are that's a damn shame it comes into play really is mm-hmm. nothing good about politics no no that it, it's it's getting worse we're, yeah. they're dividing us yeah and i don't want to be separated from my neighbor i want to i want to get out and still have a good time and not, not have to worry about politics i want to turn on the tv and watch a ball game and not have it shoved in my face i want to go to the movies or watch a tv show without it being shoved in my face I understand totally, and I agree totally, because uh, the government is set at dividing us, and that that's why they call us African Americans, Asian Americans, you know, Spanish Americans, or Latino Americans, you know, Indian Americans, you know, what's with the label? I think we're all Americans. Exactly. If you eliminate the other aspect of it, they can't separate us anymore. Now we're a group together, and that's not what they want. Well, if they keep us divided, then we won't rise up against them. Yeah. People don't realize we're we're their bosses. Yeah. We're, they're supposed to be working for us, but right. yet we we're not we don't act that way, and we're not treated that way. But uh, I have to say, I am a little bit prejudiced. I'm a Texan first, and then I'm an American. <laughs> <laughs> Texan Americans. <laughs> so, um, so what do you do nowadays? Nowadays, let's see. I'm retired totally. I don't do any contract overseas work anymore. Mm-hmm. I've retired totally. Uh, I think uh, the last time I worked for the State Department, 
did some overseas work in Africa and the Middle East and uh, money's good and stuff like that, but uh, it all depends on who's in office. So it's just, I don't, uh, I don't want to do anything anymore. No. So what I do for hobbies, I, I just, you know, I work on little things around the house and stuff like that. That's all I do. Enjoy my family. Well, I can tell just by reading your LinkedIn that I mean, you just had an interesting life and I knew you'd bring some inspiration and motivation to our audience. And uh, I want to say also, and I, I mean, this is not a cliche. I really appreciate your service and what you did for this country. It was an honor for me to serve and help out in any way I could, anybody that I came in contact with around the world and in the U.S. Well, so if uh, people want to get your book, where would they go to find it? Amazon. U.S. Amazon. Deals and their unabashed humor. Okay. And um, do you, do you um, have social media people can follow you? Other than LinkedIn? No, I got off of Facebook and I was banned from Twitter because of uh, Linda Sassauer when she said that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her or not. She's a Muslim extremist on Twitter. And she was saying that... Uh, Christian babies were not being killed by Muslims, and I provided proof to the contraire, and I was banned forever from Twitter. No oh boy. <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. I gave up Twitter. Um, it just, people were getting so ugly on there, yeah. and uh, I don't need that kind of negativity in my life. And Absolutely. I mean, I, I do have a Facebook and Instagram and a few others, and yeah. mostly I just get on there, I, I post about our shows and i don't do a whole lot of interaction on on social media i just of course uh we did we won't discuss it but we all got into a nice conversation on linkedin <laughs> which i i never really do but i just had to put my yeah. two cents in <laughs> good for you man take a sigh <laughs> I just, uh, it, it's sometimes it's funny people's reactions and, yes. and how uninformed that they are. But, you know, at the same time, it's kind of sad because you still see where the division is. It is sad. But anyway, um, Mr. Allman, or should I say Billy, Please. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Um, your stories are funny. I've got to get this book. So one more time, what's the name of it? U.S. Navy SEALs and their unabashed humor. All right, on Amazon. I want to see if I can find the link to that, and I'll post it in our description cool. and, um, and and see if we can't sell a few more copies for you. I need to get one for myself. There you go. Well, once again, thank you, and I want to thank everybody out there that, that watches and listens to us and supports us. Um, if you haven't already, Please subscribe to the channel, uh, hit that notification bell, like this video or if you're listening to it on the audio part. And um, also, if you have any comments, hey, please drop one, good or bad. I like Neither to hear from everybody. I, yeah, me too. You know, <laughs> I don't. I don't try to censor anybody. If if I'm doing something wrong, tell me. You know? Absolutely. I don't believe in censorship. And I, whether I agree with you or not, you should be able to have your say. Exactly. But thank you, sir. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. All right. You have a great one. You do the same. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Because it's only through your support that we're able to continue doing the things that we do. And until the next one, have a great, great day.